All right, let's take a look at the Actel Igloo part here on a real FPGA. This is a fairly small board. It's only 50 millimeters by 33 millimeters. Couple of 0.1 inch headers here. There's the uh, JTAG interface down here. 0.1 inch um, dual row pin header down there. Pretty standard, but look at the size of this chip here and a couple of 0603 surface mount uh, bypass caps. Let's take a look at the chip. It is absolutely tiny. And uh, if we have a look at the uh, 3D view here, you can see that the FPGA itself is only three millimeters by three millimeters. And it really is not much bigger than, than the footprints of the two 0603 bypass capacitors here. Absolutely crazy. It's uh, That's how small this device um, actually is. It's one of the uh, the smallest FPGA on the market, but uh, I mean, we can go for smaller uh, bypass uh, caps there, of course, but um, really, you know, it depends on the design you want to do. This is a prototype, so I'm going to use 0603. Now, the device, as we've mentioned, is a uh, 0 0.4 millimeter pin pitch, so it's 0 0.4 millimeters between each one of those pins. Now, this is a um, standard uh, footprint for this uh, for this particular BGA device. It's 36 pins. You can see the tiny little pads in there. Now, um, the first thing you're going to want to do when you put this down is to figure out how you're actually going to uh, route out or what's called fan out the pins on this device. And that is dependent upon whether you're using a uh, double-sided board or you're using a multi-layer board. Now, I'm going to put this on a double-sided board, and I've decided to actually uh, completely fan out the device on the one layer. And I can do this because it's only effectively uh, two layers deep on the outer um, pads to get down to the core down here. Now, these are uh, traces because, um, well, FPGA, when you're fanning out these sort of things, there's a whole trade-off between uh, how many layers PCB you're going to need when you're fanning out these BGA type devices as opposed to a quad flat pack or something like that which has all the pins around the outside and you can just uh, route them out really easily but because this is a BGA device a ball grid array real pain in the ass and uh, this is why it's a massive trade-off between your ability to route out the traces and the minimum trace width these traces I've got here they're only 0.1 millimeters or uh, just on four thou uh, width and a lot of the cheap PCB manufacturers will not be able to do four thou traces if you want to go to um, you know or, or you'll have to pay more for that technology so we're using a four thou tr track and space as it's called in between here then uh, really we have to uh, pay a manufacturer who's capable of manufacturing a what's called a four four um, spec board four thou trace four thou clearance and that doesn't include any vias at all on this design. Now, I've got some vias up here. Now, they might look uh, like typical vias, but take into account that my grid space in here is 0.1 millimeters. Okay, each one of these grids, and this via here is a hole size, a drill hole size of 0.1 millimeters. It's ridiculously small, and it's got a pad diameter of 0.2 millimeters. You know, that's quite leading edge stuff. Uh, you would be very hard pressed to get um, anyone to do anything under this one here, which is a 0.3 millimeter uh, hole size or a no and a 0.4 millimeter pad. Now, generally you wouldn't do that because um, you would want to include a bigger ratio between the via hole size and the pad size. So you might want to increase that to say 0.5 millimeters like that so you don't get what's called a uh, via breakout so the drill is not always aligned perfectly and it, you don't want it to break out the pad so you've got to take into account what your PCB manufacturer specifies in their uh, tolerance there but that's a 0.3 millimeters which for general boards you would not want to go below 0.3 millimeter drill size trust me uh, you're in for a lot of expense and um and special costing now this is a 0.4 millimeter via size here but um i would typically use on a dense surface mount board i'll typically my standard via will be 0.3 millimeters like this one now if i try and drag that via under this chip 
And <laughs> you can see, because it's only a 0.4 millimeter pin pitch, I can't use a 0.3 millimeter via under there. It's impossible. Maybe I could get away with a 0.2 millimeter via if I reduced the solder mast expansion, which we've got here, but we'll talk about that in a second. If I want to uh, actually uh, fan out this FPGA on different layers with vias, I'm going to have to use a 0.1 millimeter drill size. Maybe I can get away with 0.2, but it's just crazy. Now, um, solder mask, as I was showing in my soldering tutorials, is very, very important here. Look, you can see that tiny sliver down there. The manufacturer is not going to be able to manufacture that. Okay, there'll be no solder mask left. We've actually got a what's called a solder mask expansion here of uh, 0.05 millimeters or 2 mil or 2 thou. Okay, that is a very small uh, solder mask expansion. On a general board, you might use, say, 4 thou, but because this is a very dense uh, chip, which, by the way, this chip drives this entire design. Okay, you might have through hole parts on the rest of your board, big through hole parts, massive uh, pin pitches. You can use 20 thou tracks, 20 thou space, but because you've decided to use this little tiny piss ant FPGA in this pain in the ass uh, 0.4 millimeter pin pitch BGA package, bingo, instantly. Your, uh, to get your PCB manufactured, you've got to go down to at least four, four thou rules, or if you wanted to route out individual vias on different layers, say this was a four layer board and you wanted to use the you know, a drop through to the bottom layer to route out some of those pins, well, you've got to use a tiny little drill size like that. Now, I could actually um, change my solder mask expansion if the manufacturer uh, actually could actually do this. I could change it down to say one thou like that and you'll see it change and in this case I might be able to get away with a uh, 0.2 millimeter <laughs> maybe but look at the solder mask expansion there it's bugger all so you don't want your paste uh, when you solder this in your solder paste to short out to your via and you would want what is called a tented via so you'd want to go in there and you'd want to force tenting onto those vias like that so that uh, uh, there is no solder mask expansion. So when you uh, flip to the 3D view, you'll actually uh, see the difference there. So if I drag, say, two vias in here like this, I've got my 0.1 millimeter one here, my 0.2 millimeter. This one has uh, tenting on the top of the via, top and the bottom. So uh, if we go into 3D view here, you'll see... You'll notice that uh, it's, 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 this is what uh, one of the things 3D mode is really great for because it can actually show you the, uh, the real solder mask expansion on the board and what it's actually going to look like. In this case, it's a blue solder mask and you can see the individual pads there and the solder mask expansion. Once again, remember, we've only got a very tiny, very tight tolerance, one thou solder mask expansion on those pads. The manufacturer is going to choke when they hear that. They're going to charge you a crap load of money if they're actually able to do that at all. But as you can see, this one here, this uh, 0.2 millimeter hole here, doesn't matter if it's 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters, what the size is, but because it's uh, forced tenting on top of those, then um, there is no chance of uh, paste, when you uh, manufacture your board, you'll lay down some solder paste, no chance of it shorting to the via next to it. But look at this one here. It's tiny, and that distance in there is only going to be less than 0.1 millimeters. It's tiny. So if you accidentally get some solder bridging across there, you're in deep trouble if you've applied too much solder paste. So really, when you're doing high-density uh, BGA boards like this, make sure that you uh, tent your vias, and you may actually have to plug them too. You may have to get the manufacturer to what's called plug it, and they actually put a little uh, resin or something in, in inside to plug the hole first so that the solder mask truly does uh, cover it. But when you're talking about like a 0.1 uh, millimeter hole like this one, which is insanely small, it's almost a micro uh, via um, size, really. So um, again, I've just uh, tented that one. There you go. It's... Uh, it's tented. Just make sure you tent or plug them. Otherwise, you could end up with massive shorts under there, and you won't be able to inspect it, of course, and you won't know until you go and actually uh, power up your prototype, and it could actually even go bang. If you accidentally short out uh, ground and power, poof, release the magic smoke. Oops. 
Now, I got a little bit uh, sidetracked there talking about all that sort of stuff, but we're talking about fanning out this FPGA, either using vias or uh, tracers. Now, because this is only two layers, two pin layers deep, I'm actually able to get one trace out there. I can't get tr two, really, because we're already down to 4 thou, or 0.1 millimeter track width. But uh, sometimes on some FPGAs, especially on the larger uh, pin pitch ones, you can actually get two tracks out between one individual uh, pin. Now, if this FPGA was any bigger, we would not be able to route out uh, the extra tracks here. We'd be forced to use some vias here to drop through to our other layers. Bingo, we've instantly uh, meant that we have to um, get 0.1 or 0.2 millimeter drill hole boards, much more expensive, pain in the ass. But anyway, um, I figured out a way to uh, route or fan out this device just based on a single layer here. So uh, if you'll notice, each quadrant of the FPGA like this is basically a rotational mirror image of the one up here. Well, it's not quite, but it's uh, close. Sort of this one matches that. This quadrant matches the diagonal quadrant over there and uh, so on. And uh, and really, it is quite a nice symmetrical rotational design. I like it. Brings a bit of a tear to the eye, really. So we've routed out these using 4 thou traces. Okay, let's switch to imperial mode because I like to use imperial, not metric mode for my uh, traces, but for hole sizes and board sizes and things like that, I use metric. Go figure. But uh, yeah, that's just the way the a lot of the industry works. The PCB industry does mix up their uh, their millimeters and their thous quite a lot. Um, but you have to generally juggle both when you're doing a PCB design like this. Anyway, um, this means that we can um, sort of start fanning out um, these using larger traces. We might uh, say go to a six thou trace or something like that when we um, take that because you don't want to use a four thou trace all over your board so you might just fan it out with those small uh, four thou traces or you could even uh, say fan it out with say an eight thou trace perhaps you might be able to get away with that but just watch your clearances in there um, if you don't have enough space there we go we might yeah that's probably going to be enough space in there so we could fan this out with an eight with eight millimeter traces no problems at all so there you go that is um basically uh vanning out a a uh, fpga a 0.4 millimeter pitch bga device really if you can avoid it uh, using these type of packages and these devices do it because it can be uh, uh, really expensive and a real pain in the butt. And uh, likewise, uh, we're trying to get our bypass caps here close to our uh, close to our power pins in here. So you drag it all the way over here, and then you might have, say, a uh, a via in here like this. Okay, dropping it down to a um, you know a power tracer on on a different layer. But look, this is a 0.3 millimeter via, which is the um, which is the minimum size I would be comfortable with on on a basic board like this without uh, paying a lot more. Some people would even say 0.4 millimeters is too small. Okay, but once I get in there, you can see that routing out these becomes a bit of a pain. And then I've got to move my cap in here and uh, it just it gets really quite ugly really quickly, uh, especially if you've got a lot of bypass caps on a design like this. Now, a lot of um, FPGA designs, especially some more advanced ones, will actually, um, the bypass caps will be directly under the chip on the bottom layer, uh, the bottom side of the board and what's called a um, called a two-sided load uh, components on both sides of the board. So you can get a very low inductance path between your pad. Like if your vias here like this, okay, I might swap component down to the bottom layer down there, okay, it's now flipped over to the bottom, and I might sit that on the bottom like that, okay, so I can actually get, if this was a huge device, like a massive, big, you know, four, five hundred, or a thousand pin BGA device, I'd put that bypass cap on the bottom there, and bingo, it's disappeared, you'll find that it's actually vanished onto the bottom side of the board, right next to the via, that uh, allows me to get a low inductance path through to that bottom layer but really this was a very basic implementation a very light the lowest end fpga you can get and there's actually a lot of factors i didn't cover but go check the data sheets don't be scared of these sorts of devices just be aware 
that there's lots of traps for young players, a lot of things which drive your design decisions for FPGA, not only on the schematic and the component level, but on the PCB level as well. So that was like one extreme example there of a ultra tiny 3mm by 3mm FPGA with not many I.O. but it had a killer 0.4mm pin pitch and that really made the process technology for the PCB uh, quite difficult but hey we could actually fan all of that out on just the one layer so we could actually technically do a two layer board there if you didn't want to do ground planes or whatnot you could get away with it now let's go to an, a, a completely opposite example here opposite in two ways one this is an pretty much extreme pin count fpga we've got 1131 pin bga but the pin pitch the ball pitch is instead of 0.4 millimeters it's one millimeter so you can practically drive a truck through a one millimeter uh, pin pitch. So let's have a look at this. This is a board I designed uh, quite a long time ago. Um, this is based on a Vertex uh, 5. I'll give you a uh, squiz. Isn't that jazzy? Anyway, it's a ver whoa, ver Vertex 5 FPGA for those playing along at home. And that's the part number. The FFG, uh, the 1136 in there means it's 1136 pins. And this is like an $800 BGA. It's not cheap at all. It's got uh, a SRAM. It's got flash. It's got uh, controlled impedance differential uh, traces to Rocket IO. It's got uh, 10 gigabit um, SATA connection on it and things like that. So let's actually have a look. Now, this is actually a 10 layer PCB. Why? Because not only uh, do you need that for the control, uh, the high speed differential uh, traces you need ground planes in there to uh, create your controlled oh well you don't necessarily need those but they helped a lot for the uh, controlled impedance traces but mainly because uh, the number of layers is dictated by how many pins you've got on your FPGA here and with 1136 pins we basically needed 10 layers to fan this thing out and do all the ground planes and all the different power planes and stuff that we wanted so let's actually take a look on the bottom here here we go and you can see that we've got a smattering of uh, bypass caps around here this isn't a very good example of a nice symmetrical design uh, bypass arrangement I can show better examples of that but you know I, I didn't really want need or want to uh, show that here but you can see that all the vias are uh, tented but as you'll see they didn't really uh, need to be in this particular case so uh, what have we got yeah and you can whoop whoa not sure what's going on there okay uh, they were <laughs> I think something that was supposed to be uh, surface mount on the top I'm not no nah, something's gone horribly wrong with the model don't look at that um, don't look at the uh, man behind the curtain so let's actually go into uh, 2d mode and take a squeeze at this board zoom all here we go so now we'll be able to see the different layers so I'll go into single layer mode basically and we can uh, go through the different layers here so you can see this is the top layer so you can see how um, I've actually fanned out the uh you can see how here i've actually chosen the outer row of pins here um you are limited it depends on the the internal structure of the uh chip but i for the high speed rocket io uh stuff these are all the uh high speed differential pairs coming out you can see that they're uh, length matched and things like that um not only matched length from e for each pair because i've uh, snaked it like that that matches the uh, length in there but also these little wiggles in there wiggle 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 yeah that l matches the length of this one of this trace to its opposite pair there and that's important not only to match between the different pairs but also in between the two pairs as well so anyway that's just a little aside so that's on the uh, top layer and as you can see here I've basically uh, fanned out every single here are the uh, BGA pads okay and I've basically fanned those out to a very large via look at this this is let's go into metric mode 0.3 millimeters 0.6 millimeter oh, uh, 0.3 millimeter hole with a 0.6 millimeter pad and I was able to do that because uh, because I can um, because this is a very wide one millimeters between these pins 
these BGA balls here, they're one millimeter each. For those playing along at home, that uh, pad size is 0.5 millimeters. And you might take that from the IPC standard, or in this case, the Xilinx uh, recommended footprints or whatever it is you want to, you choose to use uh, for this thing. Now, you can see they've basically fanned out every single pad here to the differential except for some kind of un tiny unused ones here i guess i just like i went through and did a tidy up pass at the end and just went well that pin's unused i won't bother even fanning that one out but you could just in case um you needed to do that but you can see that i didn't I don't necessarily need to tent uh the vias in this particular case because i'm it's a one millimeter ball to ball uh distance and i can fit a reasonable size Via in there, 0.3 millimeters with 0.6 millimeter pad. Awesome. We could, and this is on a huge 1100 pin BGA. We couldn't do that before on that little tiny PSANT 3 millimeter by 3 millimeter FPGA because the ball pitch was far too small. So that determined our. Uh, manufacturing geometry in this case um, you know my, my traces this is just like really basic uh, like five thou right five uh, mil uh, trace in space I think there's clearance on this is like five mil so it's actually this board even though it uses a much bigger much more expensive uh, much vastly higher pin count FPGA its manufacturing tolerances are much wider because dictated by the pin pitch so if we go back here to the uh, 3D view and we disable all the uh, 3D packages, you can see that all my uh, my top uh, vias in there, they're all tented. So all we've got is the BGA ball pad with a tiny bit of uh, solder mask expansion there on the pad. But like I said, like there's large tolerances there and the maybe I didn't have to... Uh, actually tent that uh, via in there but as a matter of course you would actually tent even though the tolerances are quite large here you would tent all the vias on the top there but on the bottom I did but you don't have to in fact it's handy not to um, I'm not sure why it's done in this particular case I can't remember but uh, it's handy to leave them untented on the bottom because then you can solder little mod wires onto them uh, use them as test points and access uh, things like that so that's uh, just like because you don't have to worry about solder paste on the uh, bottom here except with uh, you know nearby pads and stuff like that but it's not as big a deal as it is under the FPGA chip itself okay for those who want to see all the different layers so that's the top layer uh, you can see that I'm mostly fanning out these uh, ones on the side now I could with the uh, pin pitch here um, ball pitch I could have actually got went down to four thou four thou and I could have routed out two traces between pads and I've got other boards where I've done that no problems might have even been three in one case in an extreme example um, somewhere but basically uh, two is you know pushing it but you can with a large one millimeter pin pitch or a uh, say a 1.27 uh, millimeter pitch for example on modern some modern large parts do that to allow you to fan out on cheaper double and f sided and four layer boards but really with this particular board cost really wasn't you know a huge uh, issue whether or not it was six layers or ten layers didn't really matter a huge amount if it was really for high volume production yeah I'd probably be optimizing trying to get trying to fan out uh, two traces between uh, pads so then you know I might be able to get with a lower count um, uh, lay layer count board so anyway let, let's have a look let's go down the layers and what I've done here is I've just uh, removed all the ground planes so we can go through and we see the uh, fan out a bit nicer there. So there's the different uh, signal layers. So I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different uh, signal layers there and the other three are devoted to uh, power and ground planes and you'll notice that one here this is not actually ground this is actually how I get in uh, this is a 2.5 volt uh, net this is the uh, FPGA core so I actually uh, bring that in from over here snake that in but you can see how like you know not complicated you know, this is 1,000, I'm not sure if I've used all, um, but I've probably used like eight or 900 pins or something like that. And there's not that, you know, it's not that complicated. It gets more complicated when you're forced to do it on a cheaper 
number a cheaper board with a smaller number of layers but that is like quite neat and tidy and of course the pin swap in really made this essential you can see all the uh you know all the pin swaps around here so it was just you know very neat and tidy when you got the luxury as a pcb designer luxury of a 10 layers for a board like this you just go ah no sweat you know but when they go you got to do it on six layers we need to shave it you know another couple of bucks off uh, each board then you you know it gets much more harder much messier it's much nicer like this because you can get grounds between all your different layers you get like your signal integrity is much better your uh, your ground impedances are much uh, lower and everything's just much uh, ground inductances and everything are much lower and it's just much nicer like that and you can um have a, you know separate differential uh pairs within separate ground planes and stuff like that so this is not a particularly complicated board uh at all but i just wanted to show you a large pin count bga with a luxurious one millimeter pin pitch beautiful the good thing about having the ground plane is that they're super low impedance and for high speed fpgas like this that need lots of bypassing it's all about the loop inductance loop area i've done separate videos on that i'm sure um, and ground planes are pretty much essential on something like this so even if you could fan it out on a double-sided board you might go uh, pretty much be forced to go to a four layer board so that you could at least have a ground plane on there and then have the bypass gaps caps going to that so let's go through this is layer three this one actually has a combination of some signal traces coming out you can see the sata ones the sata connections once again with the uh, uh differential pair length and also um pair matching as well but uh I just thought I'd show you more ground plane and then we've got signal and then you just flood fill with ground plane that was basically what I was doing there so I haven't aggressively tried to fan that this out on the minimum uh, number of layers it was you know pretty generous um, uh, being able to use a 10 layer board here you know I you'd at least target an eight layer board in this particular uh, example and as for the bypass caps on the bottom, as I said, this is not very symmetrical, but there's uh, like uh, some large ones on like the one volt uh, core here. There's a 2.5 volt uh, uh, core voltage as well. And there's probably some IO, yep, some IO over here at 3.3 uh, volts. So just a smattering, usually in most uh, FPGA uh, pinouts if you go and look at the uh, pinouts for them uh, generally all of the pound ground and power are uh, clumped around the middle and that's why if you look at the bottom of any uh, any production board with an FPGA you'll typically find um, if they're double-sided load which you know your big pin count uh, high-speed ones are then you'll find all the bypass caps clumped around the middle of the chip instead of the outside they leave the outside for the io so that you can fan them out easier because if you've got all your io in the middle and all your ground on the outside then fanning them out on your layers can be a real pain in the butt so they've thought about that when they actually design and lay out the silicon um, and have most of the ground and power uh, pins in the middle and if we go to the top we might be able to see that look most of them are ground pins see one volt ground ground there's a couple of ones in here that that are nets but like a good lot of them look a whole you know whole big inner quadrant of them are ground and power cores so that's great and all they just leave all the uh io to the outside you know there's a few other like 3.3 volt oh no no that's a net is it anyway and most of the outside ones are going to be um your io so there you go that's a look at a 1136 pin BGA you'll notice these things over here these traces over here look look at these these little joiners this is how you do pin swapping in Altium designer uh, maybe I should do a video on that because it's kind of cool because if you have a look at the schematic let's have a look right here's all the IO banks right <laughs> this is all the IO banks for the FPGA and there's just an absolute like there's a ton of these things and what you do is you go in there uh, yeah I, I won't do it now but you go in there and you basically fan out the FPGA Altium has an automated fan out tool so it allows you to fan it out I don't sometimes I use that sometimes I did and I did it manually can't remember if I did it hit, use the automatic one here or not but then you route out the traces right around to the edge like this and then you basically route in right so you don't well you you put all your signal names on here 
right? But then you uh, fan them out to here and you leave a gap and then you bring in, you, you route in all your other memory chips and everything else. So you can note how, you know, nothing like the like this uh, flash chip, for example, doesn't go to the other side of the FPGA. It just, I just routed them into here like this, right? And, you know, just nice routing on there. And then what you do is you run the FPGA pin swapping tool and it will go in there and reorganize and you can set banks to, to keep them within banks. That's important. Um, and I won't explain why. And to, and it goes through and swaps all those nets to match up. It's really like magic. Um, so hands up if you want to see a separate video on that. But it's very Altium designer specific. It's not, you know, a generic thing for uh, PCB layout tools. Actually, I'll just show you that uh, automated fan out tool in Altium Designer. This is uh, specific. So I've actually dragged the chip out of there and I've done a test one down here. It does actually work. So what you do is you go in and set up all your rules first. You set up your uh, via uh, size, your hole size, your uh, pad size, you set up your uh, spacing, your clearances and all that uh, sort of stuff designed on your manufacturing rules based on the manufacturer that you're going to uh, target and we can just go in here to route, fan out and individual component and once again it gives us some options, fan out pads without any nets um, and it means if you have no net signed to that particular pad it'll fan it out anyway as I said before about the unused pad if it's unused you might want to fan them out because you might want to be able to attach the stuff later highly recommended if you've got the uh, space so just leave that ticked and then you can uh, do stuff like uh, blind uh, vias and stuff like that that are buried down in the layers and we won't uh, worry about any of that let's just go okay and watch the magic Come on, magic computer, magic out, ta-da, there you go. We fanned out an 1136-pin BGA instantly, just like that. And it's done it in quadrants, as you can see, like that. And uh, it, it just knows that's the smartest way to do that particular uh, component. And Altium Designer specifically knows about, you know, fanning out BGAs, and it's fanned out um, unused pins that don't have any uh, nets and stuff like that. So there's lots of unused there's quite a few unused ones around here, and it's found them out. Anyway, there you go. Um, has it uh, has it tented those? Nah, look at that. <laughs> Horrid. I oh, guess we don't ever have any solder masks. Dirt. Look at that. <laughs> That's hilarious. Look, you can see all the different layers. You can see all the different layers. That is great. <laughs> That's one one of the cool things. You can actually go inside the. You can go inside the board, by the way, with Altium Designer, 3D view, look at that. You can go inside. That's just great. Love it. Love it. It's actually, it's not just like a gimmick. It's actually very valuable. So you can see the larger space in here between, you see the core that we've actually set. It's got a larger uh, pre-peg, pre-preg between the boards, uh, between the <laughs> layers. Sorry, but that's, yeah, that's very cool. Sorry, I don't have my space navigator. I'm, uh, <laughs> that's just neat. I always get a kick around playing with that. It's great. <laughs> Never gets old. But anyway, there you go. That's a look at fanning out uh, FPGAs. I just wanted to show you that extract it from an older video that I had because I thought it was kind of interesting. So anyway, if you like that, please give it a big thumbs up because that always helps a lot. And if you want more uh, PCB, type stuff like this yes definitely give it a thumbs up leave it in the comments and i will know to do more if uh pcb type stuff hope you liked it catch you next time